We start with a, let's say, a new topic that will be lectured by uh, Tomasz Prosin uh, from the University uh, of Ljubljana. So Tomasz has been a very inspiring person, uh, like building the, the, the field of uh, integrability and understanding chaos and really putting Ljubljana on the map of kind of non-equilibrium centers, and we are looking forward to his lectures on uh, dual unitary circuits and chaos. Thank you. Thank you, Zala. Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, as Zala said, I mean, uh, we'll start a new course now, uh, which I will give mo mainly or exclusively on Blackboard. I will see how it goes, but uh, I, for this type of courses, I'm in favor of Blackboard courses. I hope you are agreeing with me, so uh, I also expect that if anything is unclear, please ask questions, stop me, or whatever. So, uh, I will just write title. Uh, uh, we'll speak about, well, in general, quantum circuits, but more uh, in detail, we'll elaborate on this uh, notion of dual unitary quantum circuits. And uh, as a teaser, I will put a subtitle, which is Integrable Chaos and Beyond. Well, we'll see how much beyond we can go, but uh, if you understand these two words, it will be already fine, because, you know, I put it as an oxymoron on purpose. I don't know if you see that that is an oxymoron, right? I mean, chaos is usually contrary to integrability. Uh, and we can discuss for a whole series of lectures what, what integrability means, and I think will not be clear after a couple of hours because we can confuse ourselves on and on. Of course, there is precise mathematical physics apparatus which allows us to work on, with integrable systems, but still it's very elusive how to define integrability. So I would like to also claim that what we'll, I will speak about in these three lectures will be also something like integrable chaos because we'll use some algebraic tricks how to um, solve dynamics of many body systems in a way which is similar to what we can do in some integrable systems. I mean, uh, there is some algebraic tricks behind. There is some uh, uh, cancellations which happen because of some magic. Yeah? And, uh, you know, magic is never good because it says that, you know, it's not a uh, real world, right? Uh, well, still I want to convince you that this might smell a little bit like a real world. I mean, at least uh, we hope. So, but even if not, I mean, it's great to have some example of exactly solvable dynamics, even though it's a very special one. And if you can go a little bit beyond, I'll tell you what I believe can be done beyond this, so uh, we can maybe say something about more real-world problems, <clears throat> which is always hard, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's our uh, title. So. Uh, I will spend probably half of my lecture today basically to introduce uh, to you to tensor, well, to circuits, right? I'm not sure actually yesterday I had to leave uh, to Ljubljana, so I'm not sure uh, how much uh, Sun Wan uh, told you about uh, circuits. As I, I believe he, 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 he's all about random circuits, right? So, I mean, you, you, you heard already the basics of circuits, even though I, I don't want to assume any kind of very, very special, specialized pre-knowledge so I will try to go slowly, because I think, uh, I mean, these this, this two buzzwords, right? Circuits and tensor networks, uh, which will be kind of the graphic language to work with circuits. Um, these are extremely important in this, this field of physics because they, it allow us to do very, very powerful formal manipulations in a very kind of elegant and simple ways. I mean, I would even claim that you know, the notation of tensor networks is something that competes with Dirac notation, right? I mean, we learn Dirac notation when we learn quantum mechanics because it's so super efficient, right? Sometimes you have to convince your friend mathematicians that that's useful because they hate it, right? Because hate it because it's so nice, right? Because it's just a couple of rules you have to learn and you can forget about mathematical meaning of these objects, right? Uh, tensor networks, the grammatics of tensor networks is even worse, right? You just learned that the rules and then you can work with it even forgetting about what are really the objects behind, right? So what are tensor networks? <clears throat> so tensor networks are basically graphs, right, where 
uh, nodes of the graphs are tensors, and then the edges basically correspond to contracting uh, indices of tensors, right? So now, like, uh, if we have two matrices, right, A, I, J, and B, I, J, then the product of matrices would be another matrix where you put A and B here. This is I, this is K, and this is J, right? This would be just a product of matrices, right? Now, usually in this field, we have, we have uh, tensors of higher degree than two, so we had uh, more than two legs. So, for example, usually we, we, it's, very, it's very common to work with tensors which have three legs. Let's say I, A, I, J, K, I, J, K. Sometimes I will write indices explicitly, but later we will stop doing that. So we just write uh, a tensor network and uh, uh, all the dangling ends will correspond to free indices and all the connecting, connecting bonds will correspond to indices we are, which are summed over, right? So a very popular version of a tensor network is a matrix product state, which is composed of this type of tensors with three legs. The leg which stick out, the perpendicular leg, is usually something special, which is a, called a physical space. It corresponds to physical Hilbert space. And by the way, I mean, I don't want to formalize too much, but of course, I mean, you can easily imagine each index in linear algebra corresponds to a vector space, right? So the number of indices that tensor has basically corresponds to the number of tensor products of Hilbert spaces that it acts on, right? So if it has n indices, you could think of this A to be an element of a, a, a C, D, cross C, D, cross C, D, right? Each index corresponds to one element of tensor product space. Now I assume that all these factors have equal dimension. It's not necessarily so. For example, I mean, these vertical indices might have different dimension. They are corresponding to physical space. Those horizontal indices correspond to auxiliary space, and this type of <coughs> tensor network then corresponds to this super popular object, which is called matrix product state. Right. Now, you may want to contract it at the end with some, with some, with some rank one or a degree one tensor, which is a vector, left and right vector, and then you get just a comp, which has just this vertical uh, free indices then which corresponds to a many body state, right? State of a many body system. Now here, one, two, three, four body system, right? Four sides. <clears throat> okay, I mean, I, of course, this is super short introduction, so I don't want to elaborate further on this, but we'll go straight away to circuits. But I just want to, to tell you, I mean, to, 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 to uh, stress that we will think of circuits also as tensor networks. It's very useful, even though you might not. I mean, again, uh, circuits are some special, variant of tensor networks, but it's useful to think of them as tensor networks. So basically they become less, they, they become more symmetric objects, right? You don't have to worry about which direction is the time, <coughs> right? Okay. <coughs> now this will be, I mean, I will usually not erase my, myself, but this was just like a, a really a, a, a short prologue, so I will erase it, but <coughs> we'll now start with quantum circuits. <coughs> uh, so what is quantum circuit for me? Again, this is not a quantum, a com quantum uh, information, quantum computation lecture. It's a, it's a lecture on many-body physics. So for me, quantum circuit is a, has a slightly different meaning than for a quantum infor uh, information scientist. Uh, uh, slightly different. I mean, I mean, why? I mean, I, I think of quantum circuit as a dynamical system, <clears throat> and I will explain you. And this is something that I really want to, to, to elaborate in some detail. So what do I mean by dynamical system here, right? Because if you want to speak of chaos, I mean, you have to define it sort of quite precisely. And here I will probably use a lot of, uh, I will refer to a lot of uh, claims or stand, stand, statements that uh, Anatoly Polkovnikov gave, gave the first day of this school, uh, where also he, he went quite deep into the subject of ergodicity and chaos. So I'll try to be kind of slightly more precise on this notions, and uh, for that I have to define a dynamical system, right? I mean, what I mean by dynamic system. So quantum circuit as a local discrete time, time <coughs> quantum many body dynamical system. Basically, the dynamical system is a, a box, right? It's a deterministic box in which you, 
I mean, which, which is able to, to provide you with time evolution, right? So it has, equi uh, it has um, um, <coughs> equation of motion inside, right? And uh, it can run dynamics for arbitrary long time, right? So you basically provide it with the initial state and then it provides you with the, with the output. So for me then, I mean, what do you see? What, what is already implicit here that I can run it for a long time? So it's not just one short event, but it can run repeatedly, right? So, uh, okay, so I will, I will start with, then with a basic object because I stress a couple of things, I will stress a couple of things here. I insist on locality of this discrete and on discrete time dynamics, right? So now just if you look at textbooks again, there has been during this school again, uh, some references to dynamical systems theory like in Professor uh, Yao's lectures. I mean, he referred to, to classical dynamical systems theory to uh, logistic maps and classical chaos. Um, Again, I mean, this, 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 all, all these objects are precisely defined in the context of dynamical system theory. So uh, this is the kind of deeper side of mathematics of this type of systems. But here, actually, I try to not kind of marry these two things, right? Dynamical systems with quantum circuits. <clears throat> so first, we start with the main object. Uh, main object. We'll start with a QDIT. QDIT is a local Hilbert space. Uh, for me, it will be QDIT. I mean, may most, all my examples will be for qubits, which means spin one half. But uh, just to make the story sufficiently general, uh, my single single side Hilbert space will be QDIT. So often people write uh, its dimension as Q. I prefer to use D, uh, which is immediately suggesting that it means dimension doesn't matter. Just recall that it's D for me, and then uh, I will define. These are the two concepts, and the, 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 the second concept is the gate. And the gate is a two-particle interaction, which means it takes two states of two particles and spits out an, another state of two particles. So U is an element of tensor product of two single qubit spaces. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, an, uh, endomorph it's an element of endo space of endomorphisms, meaning linear maps from a space back to itself. So it's a matrix of, I mean, you can also think of it as a unitary matrix. So it becomes to a unitary group of D square by D square matrices. <coughs> okay, that's my gate, right? So of course, in quantum information, people discuss all possible gates. For me, all these two, all these three lectures, I will only think of a two qubit gates. I mean, single qubit gates, well, I mean, sometimes I will mention, but you know, it's, it, they can always be put together with a two qubit gate. So this will be, for me, the fundamental interaction. And I will write it as a, as a, as a, as a tensor uh, with four legs, right? <coughs> uh, let's call them I, J, K, and L. And uh, time evolution for me usually will go vertically. So this would be like a gate which will take states of two particles, i and j, and it produce an amplitude to end up in states of these two particles, k and l. So it's like an S matrix. I mean, in, in kind of in more like uh, spirit of high energy physics, this could be considered as an S matrix. Of course, for, for us, it would be simply a unitary matrix which pro provides, provides local, local in time, local in space evolution for one step, right? This will be one of the basic steps. So, I mean, I will not use Dirac notation. This is probably the only time I'm using Dirac notation, but just to, to kind of remind you what I really mean. And then when I have to write a matrix, I will write it like this, that lower indices will be a row and upper indices will be a column. So it will be like, um, <clears throat> like this, right? <coughs> and here I can sum over i, j, k, and l. <coughs> Now, what we all know is that U should be unitary, which means that, um, <clears throat> what does it mean? That uh, U dagger U has to be equal to identity. And now if, it, uh, if I write it in, 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 in components, this means that if I sum over KL, U dagger uh, KL IJ U K L I prime J prime, this will be equal to delta I I prime, delta J J prime. Okay, that's kind of, uh, of course, obvious to all of us, but you see, I insist then that even unitarity should be useful to write, to spell out explicitly because in the language of tensor networks is a simple contraction of a simple diagram. So how can I write now this formula in terms of a diagram? 
Well, basically, this is a contraction of two, two tensors, two boxes, right? One is U, and the other is U dagger. And I start with uh, I prime, J prime here, right? And this is K, and I will now still write explicitly the names of indices K and L, and then I go to I and J, right? <laughs> and uh, what, I, what, this di what this equation means now is simply that I can contract this diagram so which means that uh, these, these two guys is like particle and antiparticle, they annihilate, right? So then there is just a free, free map, I mean, uh, identity map, right? Prime I, J prime J, and if two indices are connected with a line, which means they have to have the same value, right? They are, this is like identity matrix. It's a tensor. It's a tensor which corresponds to identity matrix, okay? So this is the two, these two is the product of these two product of the others, right? So it's all clear, right? If anyone has a question here, I mean, this is the language we have to we will use. Yeah. 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 Uh, what is geometrically local? Yes, it's, it's geometrically local in this sense, yes, yes. Uh, you will see when I build the circuit now, it's still, I'm still not there, but you will see immediately, yeah. It's, 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 yeah. Pardon me? Well, I'm not using any density matrices yet. I mean, I will use later uh, if you want. Uh, as you will see, this is discrete time dynamics. So the only density matrix uh, which makes sense is the infinite temperature state. So I will use the threshold state or the infinite temperature heap state or fully mixed density matrix. But it comes out later. So <coughs> okay. So now I will, I will basically introduce a concept which probably you have mentioned already yesterday, I'm not sure because I was not here, but of a brickwork circuit. So that's a particular geometry of a circuit which allows all qubits to be eventually coupled to all other qubits in a local fashion, right? So, and it really mimics what physics does. I mean, it's right, it's a, okay. Uh, right, so now I will define, uh, I will define now a spin chain. And spin chain now is a Hilbert space of L qubits. Right? And I will assume that L is even for convenience. I don't have to, but for my uh, purpose, it will be useful if L is even. And, uh, and, uh, also, I will assume periodic boundary conditions. Again, for convenience, I wouldn't have to, but uh, for most of my discussion, actually L will be a large number. I will, for, 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 for claims which would be exact, uh, L would have to be a large number, so we would have to take table dynamic limit, but even that is not crucial for most of the statements we make, so L could be finite, sometimes sufficiently large, but finite. And then I will define um, a simple um, tensor product of gates, uh, so this will be like a one layer, a layer of gates, which I will now define as UE, which will be U tensor product L over two times. And now, again, uh, I don't want to get too abstract, so I will immediately write a diagram which does it. So now this is uh, now uh, an element of space of linear operators over the full Hilbert space, right? It's a unitary operator, but... And now what does it do? <coughs> it takes What does it mean tensor product? Tensor product for uh, us means just uh, put one picture next to another, right? It's again very clear, right? Tensor product is just combining pictures <coughs> of tensor networks, right? <coughs> so that's a tensor network of that's a tensor product of a tensor network. So now that this is 1 2 up to L and this is what I will, what I will, uh, maybe I should, sorry, uh, allow me to, to write this picture a little bit lower. I will use this space. Uh, and I will write just four boxes, not an uh, indefinite number of boxes, but four just for graphical convenience. And uh, you see uh, what I do, I, I, I uh, 
I, it also becomes clear late, uh, slightly later in a moment, but contrary to most of quantum, com quantum computational literature, I mean, I write these uh, wires under 45 degree angles, right? Where people usually write circuits is just straight wires, right? And then they write gates. Uh, it's all the same, right? Because both can be sort of a tensor networks. But for me, since I really want to insist these are like very symmetric tensors, I will, for the symmetry purpose, I will write also these wires under 45 degree because later I will look at it as a tensor, as a circuit from sideways direction. <clears throat> but anyway, it, it's not, for that moment, it's not important. And then I will define uh, another kind of a map, which will be a shift. Pi. So pi again is a, a, a endomorphism, right? And what it does, I mean, it's enough to specify it, how it works on a, a basis, and basis can be a tensor product. It basically shifts shift cyclically shifts by one. Okay, so then I will define I will define what I call u what I will call as u odd, and u odd will be pi u even pi inverse. Okay, so it will be con conjugation with a shift. Uh, and what does it mean? It means I have to just rename the wires. So what is two, one now becomes two, and what is two, what becomes three, and so on. So which means that if I write uh, u odd, u odd will be simply a that times a product of gates which sit here on this other set of wires. And then I'm coming back home, right? Uh, now since there are, there are periodic boundary conditions, I have to be a bit careful. Uh, there has to be four boxes, but one is already coupled to the last, okay? So this guy is the same as this guy. This is, these two ends are identical, and then I, and then here I have to come here, right? And now this is again one, two, up to L, okay? <coughs> so now, what I, why did I bother with this? I mean, of course, now I could just say people who would explain to you brickwork networks, they would just say, okay, now let's write this kind of uh, staggered uh, uh, constellation of gates, and we call this a brickwork, brickwork uh, circuit. Yeah, but it's nice also to, to see how it is generated. It's generated by a simple tensor product and a shift, right? <coughs> okay, so now I will define the full, the full uh, uh, generator. So I will now, this full generator now is split into pieces. This one is u odd, this one is u even and the composition of two is called u. So u will be u odd times u even, okay. <clears throat> All right, so now I can define dynamics. And dynamics, <clears throat> so, you know, if you look at how mathematicians define dynamical systems, they have to have a map, and they have to have a, a space of states. Space of states for us is a Hilbert space of Hilbert space vectors. So now that is dynamics, now defined as psi of t of t psi of zero. So my writing is not too beautiful, right? So I will want to insist a little bit that I write the script u for the many body uh, evolution and the Roman u for the local gate, right? Just to make sure we, for, we kind of distinguish a little bit these two things because they are fundamentally different. One is the many body, the full many body, full fledged many body dynamics, and the other is the local map. Now to make things uh, also connotationally convenient, I will, I will uh, define this time more precisely. So I will define this u of t uh, for, um, uh, uh, for odd times as u to t and for, uh, so for even times as u of t and for odd times as See, this gives u even, u odd, u odd, u even, u odd, u even, so as u to the t times u odd. <coughs> this is definition. So it's a staggered dynamics, right? Means it has fundamental building block of size two. So there is staggering in space, but there's also staggering in time. So this will be a time one, and this will be in time two, and then so on. So time goes vertically. It's a Floquet dynamics of period, Floquet derived period two, two discrete units, right? 
Now I define it. I define it as a flow key dynamics, right? Because then I repeat the same thing. Maybe I should say also a little bit on what I assume about translation invariance. I also assume that all the gates are the same, as you have seen. Um, so that this dynamics is translation invariant and time translation invariant. Uh, so we can again discuss, uh, for example, the, 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 the question of time crystals or I mean, uh, all that. I, mean, I will not go into that, but you know, these are kind of perfect models for, for studying time crystals as well. Um, now, the, the question is, of course, we have to break into ergodicity, as you have learned from, from Norman Yao. So uh, somehow, uh, yeah, there might be ways. One way is integrability. If you want to break it with some disorder, then you need, of course, to break translation invariance. But OK, I mean, I, as I say, I will not go into that. I just want to make a reference to other lectures. <clears throat> OK, uh, right. So for me, for simplicity, I will assume everything to be translation invariant. And uh, almost everything I will say immediately generalizes to completely inhomogeneous uh, circuits. So everything could depend on time, could depend on space. I mean, most of the things I will, will discuss today and most of the time tomorrow. <clears throat> OK, uh, right. So uh, I will, I don't know if I can use colors here, but. <clears throat> this I will later. <laughs> use uh, uh, yeah. uh, a sequence of these gates. I mean, I might want to, ah, doesn't really work. OK, never mind. So let's say this is, this type of uh, period will be green, and this one will be red, OK? Use later. <coughs> OK. I know, but, uh, but that, that trick to color like this doesn't work, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> OK, so uh, yeah. <clears throat> mm, I should not use the blackboard. I'm very disorganized, so I have. Yeah, yeah sure. Almost not, almost no. I will, I will convince you that I don't need to assume randomness to, to write some analytical understanding of dynamics. Yeah? It helps to have randomness, as you have seen yesterday, I think. Uh, it helps very much. And I will, tomorrow also, I will try to, uh, my, the second part of my lecture, the first part will be simply, maybe I should really say so, in order to give you some sort of uh, direction where we are going. The first part of my lectures will be computing uh, correlation functions of dynamics. For that, we don't need any randomness. For that, we just need some algebraic tricks, right, for, for the gates, which turned out to be quite interesting and allow us to compute many things, not just two-point functions. I will probably stop at two-point functions, but I'll just outline the technology. For that, no randomness needed. Now, tomorrow, I will try to also uh, go to spectral form factors, so to compute spectral correlations of these problems. To compute spectral correlations, we need to assume a little bit of randomness. Uh, it's just like a bit, a bit of, I don't know, homeopathy or something like that. You need a little bit of something, and then you can uh, almost reduce it to zero, but it's important that it's there. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, now let me make some examples. For those who have not seen this, I mean, I guess most of you have seen it, but uh, these, of course, are by no means exotic uh, uh, Concepts, it's something that is there for anyone who does, uh, I don't know, Quantum Monte Carlo or uh, DMRG or, or any tensor network based, me I mean, uh, matrix product based methods. Even when one does uh, continuous time dynamics, one encounters this, this sort of brickwork circuits. For example, uh, when you have uh, 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 tutorization of local two particle, ham two, two nearest neighbor Hamiltonians. Local. Uh, nearest neighbor Hamiltonians. This is 90% uh, of examples in condensed matter, quantum condensed matter physics is like that, right? <coughs> uh, then uh, from this, uh, when you do the throttle limit, you do the throttle limit, so u becomes e to the minus i 
tau h and tau being a small number, whatever that means, uh, be small enough compared to the norm of the Hamiltonian. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, you can prove uh, that this thing can be approximated by u odd times u even <clears throat> up to accuracy, which is, I don't know, quadratic in, in tau. <clears throat> so that's the most naive decomposition called so-called uh, Trotter-Suzuki decomposition of dynamics into steps. And then this, this gate would simply be, now, you may want to put indices, and I also have to explain what I mean by that. So uh, this is, a, if I don't write indices, I mean this is a four, four by four matrix, right? Um, <clears throat> but here I have indices, which means this guy acts uh, non-trivially non, uh, on sites one and two, or j and j plus one, right? But this already implies that there is just uh, dimension four. Now, if I put indices one and two, this means it's embedded into a bigger Hilbert space, but it acts non-trivially only on first and second tensor product copy. <coughs> so that would be our gate, right? <coughs> okay, so if you want, I can write it like this. <coughs> okay, uh, right. And then, of course, sometimes you would write, I mean, with this embedding, uh, you see, I mean, you, you can write u i j or j, j plus one, meaning that this is identity which acts on uh, the first j minus one sides, and then there is u, and then there is identity which acts on the last l minus j minus one sides, right? <clears throat> so the sum j minus one plus l minus j minus one plus two has to be equal to l, which is fine. <clears throat> okay, and then you can write, if you want, you can then write uh, our uh, tensor, pr tensor product of, uh, let's say, even layer simply as a normal product. Now this is Roman U 2J minus 1 comma 2J. Okay. Now a more interesting example, I mean at least maybe uh, more, well, at least scientifically more uh, challenging example and less, much less generic. So this would be the first example. The second example would be uh, <coughs> unitary six vertex model. There is integrability in the title of my lectures, and this will be, this 10 minutes will be kind of an example also how integrability works in these quantum circuits. Um, so this will be not the same integrability as integral chaos, but it's honest beta ansatz integrability. Uh, I just want to show you there is a connection between quantum circuits and uh, standard story of integrability in statistical physics, uh, a la Betanz, that's Young, Baxter, and uh, company. So, for example, you can write a two-particle gate like this. I mean, this one always means a unit matrix of appropriate dimension. Uh, let me write... Uh, 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 a four by four matrix like this, where this P will appear quite often in my lectures. The P is the so-called permutation matrix or a swap gate, which flips the two particles. Now, here also I will assume that D is equal to two for this example. So my map, sometimes I say matrix four by four, four by four meaning if D is equal to two, otherwise it's D squared by D squared. So here I insist that D should be equal to two. Then I have, uh, then I have, this uh, <clears throat> a two, two, two qubit uh, gate, right, which is totally trivial, which just swaps the qubits, right? So it has four non-zero elements, which means uh, ij is ji. <clears throat> And this is identity. So it's a combination. It's a kind of comp convex, but not convex, complex combination of identity and swap in a way that it's unitary. So it's easy to, sh to see that u of minus tau is u dagger of tau, right? Because if I make a Hermitian conjugation, this is self-adjoint. Self this is self-adjoint. So uh, I get just minus tau if I, if I make Hermitian conjugation. And then if I write u of minus tau times u of tau, then I get identity. 
because p square is equal to identity. The rest of the proof is an exercise. I mean, it's, I, I think most of you will see it, but for those who don't see it, it's a good exercise. Just plug this in, you see it's really an identity. You just need p square equal one. That's kind of really cool because you have a very simple gate, which is unitary, which is just a rational function of some parameter, and actually this turns out to be just six vertex model. So, uh, I mean, I really write, can write it as a, as a, as a, as a, um, four by four matrix with six different non-zero wei uh, weights, so six different non-zero elements, and this A and B, A is just one over I, one plus I tau, and B is I tau divided by one plus I tau. Okay, so that's six vertex model. Uh, in statistical mechanics, I mean, these models, again, why is six vertex model? Because, yeah, you, you haven't seen yet how this would look like, but you can imagine if I just, you know, continue this in the plane, then I have a two-dimensional two tensor network, right? One dimension is time, but who cares? So it's a two-dimensional tensor network, which is exactly what in statistical physics call a vertex model. So if you want to compute, I don't know, some scalar out of this, you press some boundary conditions here, you press some initial state here, and you compute the amplitude with respect to some final state, and it becomes a number, right? No free indices anymore, it becomes a number, and this number is just a partition sum of a StatMec model in 2D. I mean, I will go a little bit further into that tomorrow when I will discuss spectral form factor because then we'll again need this partition sum analogy. But just, you know, right away I stress, I mean, there is a lot of close links between doing circuits and tensor networks and doing StatMec in 2D. If you, if, you, if you think of local gates, right? And so then in 2D this becomes a six vertex model. This is six weights, but it's a spe special kind of six vertex model because the weights are complex. So people like Baxter would not be happy because they would like real uh, positive weights, right? Uh, but still, I mean, they provided a lot of results to us, which we now can use, right? So this, this, this can, you just have to kind of do the weak rotation if you want to go to complex plane, the weights become complex. Um, uh, the gates are no longer positive, but they are unitary, but they are still six vertex. Okay, so what does this bias, for example? This bias, I mean, this means that this model is really integrable. And what does this mean? I mean, just, you know, to, to, um, you know that this is an integrable model. I mean, uh, this is an integrable model. I will call it XXX because it is intimately, re intimately related to what is known as XXX Hamiltonian, even though it's not a Hamiltonian. It's a Floquet or trotterized XXX model, right? <coughs> it's integrable. Okay, why is this integrable? Yes, because uh, this gate now, I mean, I'll drop now XXX for convenience, but this is just um, permutation times what people in integrability calls an R matrix or they call it an R check. This is the famous R matrix. I will now just, bear with me, but I will just throw two identities from my sleeve, uh, which are very kind of interesting, but I will not prove them. I will just leave them as an exercise. I will show them, I will quickly say how to prove them, but I will not prove them. But they are kind of, I mean, at least as a teaser, maybe interesting. So it's, it's a way, I mean, uh, how do we know that this model is integrable and what does it mean that it's integrable? Well, the fundamental feature of integrability is that it has a uh, commuting set of local conserved charges. That, or in other words, equivalently, that it has a, a transfer matrix which is in involution and commutes with time evolution. So what is the transfer matrix here? So this is an R matrix, what is the transfer matrix? The transfer matrix now is a many body Again, it's a linear many-body object, <coughs> which I will write it again as a tensor network. Now, uh, we have periodic boundary conditions, and now this will be now my R, and I'll write here lambda uh, plus tau over two, and here lambda of lambda minus tau over two. R lambda plus tau over two, and so on. The last will be R of lambda minus tau over two. I write these R's in the skew fashion because I want to read it as a gate like this. Okay, if I read it as a this gate like this, I mean, 
and then this is an R matrix, but now I have to use it like this. So there are two spaces. Uh, now one is horizontal, one is vertical, and both have dimension two. But the one I think of as a auxiliary space, I usually people call it A as like an zilla or auxiliary space, and these are physical spaces, one, two, L. Okay, so now this transfer matrix, let's call it T of lambda, and now tau is a fixed parameter, but lambda is a free complex parameter. I will write it now as uh, R. Now R has two indices. Let's call them 1A, lambda plus tau over 2, R 2A, lambda minus tau over 2, up to R L minus 1, sorry. Two spaces, right? First one I call, last one, L minus 1A, lambda plus tau over 2, R L A, lambda minus tau over 2. Okay, now this acts on a which space? On a space of tensor products of 1, 2 to L, so L cop is a physical space times auxiliary space. But then I, as I say, I will connect here these things, so I will take a trace over auxiliary space. And now what we can show, and this is an exercise, okay? I wish, I'm happy to discuss this in the break for anyone who's interested, but uh, it's, not, it's, not very, it's not difficult, but it's it, still, I mean, if you, if you show it, you learn quite something. So uh, exercise, show that this U of T can be written as T of minus lambda, mi minus tau inverse times T of lambda tau. And what you need, what you need, of course, is this ident, uh, is this unitarity property of the, of the, of the gate, which is also means unitarity of the R matrix, or what people call R check matrix. And the second thing is the Young-Baxter equation, meaning that this R check satisfy equation like this. Okay, now I have to also specify here parameters, u, u plus v, 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 u plus v, u, okay? Uh, yes? Uh, sorry, what, what is the question again? Ah, uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, well, Anyway, I mean, this is something that you get in uh, two seconds when you type in Wikipedia, right? So it's, uh, it's a standard thing, right? I, I, it's like an advanced exercise for those who, who want to understand integrability and are happy to discuss later, but it's kind of sidetracking my lectures. So I don't want to go into deeper into that. Just to, the point of this kind of last 10 minutes was there is a full, whole family of circuits which are connected to integrable systems like vertex models in statistical mechanics, yet they are integrable. So you can play all your all interesting games. For example, I mean, last November there was a very interesting article in Nature by Google, which was already quoted yesterday by Google Group, where they have implemented exactly this circuit on a Sycamore quantum computer, and they have been able to show integrability. So they have been able to show anomalous features which are related to integrability, like stable quasi-particles, long, uh, long uh, uh, relaxation times, and things like that. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, lambda is a free parameter, right? So tau is a fixed, but lambda is free. So you see, I mean, what I have to do now, is, as you see here, I mean, if I put tau equal to one, uh, sorry, if I put lambda equal to one, then I have every other term where spectral parameter becomes zero. And when it's zero, then our matrix is just permutation. And this is important in order to provide uh, these two pieces of the evolution, right? So it's really the, the main trick how to derive this. Uh, right? right? This is the fundamental identity, right? So uh, I wrote it. Yeah, I wrote it, yeah. Okay. So the next thing, of course, is to show that T of lambda times uh, T of mu is a commuting family. So this is equal to zero for any lambda in mu. So that's the key feature of integrability. Integrability means that it's a commuting transfer matrix, but now it also generates the time evolution. So that's the standard thing. For those who have smelled integrability, for those who haven't, maybe can forget about this because the rest of my lecture will not be connected to that. But 
what is key, right, is to have a commuting transfer matrix and then your dynamics has to be generated by the transfer matrix. Usually it's just the logarithmic derivative of the transfer matrix is the Hamiltonian. In our case, it's a finite kind of finite time log derivative, if you want. This is a kind of finite time log derivative, right? And again, generates not the Hamiltonian, but the fundamental, the primitive uh, uh, dynamical map, <coughs> the flocking map. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that is our paper with Leonard uh, Mathieu Varnicat from 2018. So it's, uh, I think it's Mathieu the first order. It's a PRL 2018. <coughs> okay, uh, now if there's no more question on this second example, I go back now to our non-integrable circuits and try to put some other additional structure on them. <clears throat> but before doing that, let's now try to discuss fundamental observables that we want to compute. Because now it will be useful to right away define objects that you want to compute and then we'll see how to compute those objects <clears throat> on additionally structured uh, circuits. <clears throat> Okay, so <clears throat> two point functions. We start with two point functions and we, yeah, well, tomorrow as I promised, we go beyond, but <laughs> today we'll probably finish with those. <clears throat> uh, so now let's think of local observable. So A would be a local observable, which means that A can be considered as a D by D matrix. It's uh, an element of a space of matrices over a single particle Hilbert space, so it's a local observable. <clears throat> and now we embed it into HL, S, and we put an index J, or yeah, let's call it J, and then, which means, I mean, I already wrote once how I embedded the two qubit gates, but now I will embed local observable in the same way. I mean, I hope you understand this notation, right? I mean, I, I put tensor product in the exponent, I mean, I have multiple tensor products of identical copies of this object, that number of times. So it's just an identity and A at the right place. So now, how would the tensor network would look like? Tensor network would look like this. one, two, j, j minus one, j plus one, l, okay? So this is almost a, almost a unit matrix, almost a identity, except that at j side it they, does something, right? An observable is, a, is an operator, right? So an operator means it goes bottom up, right? Now, uh, <coughs> let's define Heisenberg dynamics. So I'll define AJ of T as U of minus T, A U of T, where U was defined, I erased it, but yeah, you remember, I mean, I think it would be for reference good to rewrite it again. U of 2T will be U to T, and U of 2T plus 1 will be U T times U odd. So U, remember, is U even, uh, U odd, U even, right? U odd, U even, U odd, U even, and then you end up with U odd when time is odd. <coughs> okay, uh, right. <coughs> uh, now, how, how does the tensor diagram look like? So now I will already try to show you that there is some use of this type of tensor, uh, I mean, this, this contraction rules, like unitarity. We can already use it to simplify tensor network for a j of t. So how do we do that? Now, 
to simplify life a little bit, I will uh, first. So I will I will uh, you I will paint a field bullet for an operator, right? Because the empty circle I will use for something else. So please, uh, even though my writing is usually very ugly, I mean, uh, be reminded that this is a kind of painted bullet. <coughs> and then there are two big boxes like this. This box is u of t, and this is u of minus t, right? <coughs> this is how they teach you to think of Heisenberg dynamics, right? You do forward-backward, right? Uh, forward-backward time evolution. First forward, implement observable, and then backward, right? And then if you sandwich it, sandwich it with, between two states, then it's just the same as if you, uh, if you propagate the state, and this you call a Schrodinger picture. <coughs> but now, something nice, nice happens. Now, in order to see that, maybe I can really write... Uh, just to see it, uh, I'll write it in a, as an, on an example of a four by four uh, circuit. And then we will, again, stop using this, but it's a box, four by four. I'll try to be a bit fast here, but. Maybe I'll miss some wires, but maybe not sequential, I hope, then, uh, so it's like eight, eight, eight qubits. Now I put a bullet here, and I have a joint of this guy. Um, now, here should be four, right? It should be four, 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 okay. I should be just, this is like a mirror, right? I should be uh, making sure that the top is a mirror image of the bottom across this horizontal line, so. But uh, I might also worry about periodic boundaries, but that's not too crucial now. I will now think of time being uh, L to be sufficiently large so I don't have to worry about periodic boundaries. I mean, most of you have seen this type of picture, so uh, for those of you who haven't, maybe there's none of you like that, but you see, I mean, the point is now, uh, when you contract this guy against each other, then these local gates face each other, right? Except here, which is shadowed, all these guys face each other, so then I can use these contraction rules, which is unitarity, right? That this is the same as this, okay? So this means this guy can be contracted like this. Here is like this, and here is like this. And then this guy can be contracted like this. <coughs> And then at the end of the day, if you, if you allow me, you see that everything which goes into the shadow, which is made by rays which go with the speed of light or with the speed one in this case, everything which is outside of this shadow can be contracted. So you get basically a tensor network which is not like this but which is like two triangular, triangular shaped uh, propagators. <coughs> So, so again, schematically, I mean, I'll try to be as schematic as I can without compromising uh, exactness, but you could now think of this uh, like this, and now this is a, uh, this is your A, this is now your again. U, and then, uh, it's not the same as U, but you see, the point is now that becomes, already half of the gates becomes completely redundant, right? I can remove them. So just unitarity and locality give me causality. Okay? It's again, you know, you, you have some lectures in fundamental courses in physics which, which sell this as a very deep thing, right? In this case, everything is obvious, right? So that's why I like this uh, tensor, I mean, this, this circuit so much, because most of things in f physics become really obvious once you write this as Lego cubes and, and learn how to, how to manipulate them, right? <coughs> okay. <coughs> yeah. 
every Hamiltonian evolution. Well, it has to have local interactions, yeah. Indeed, indeed. It is also a basically intuitive explanation of Lee Robinson, if you want. <coughs> of course, I mean, uh, when you do Hamiltonian, you have to worry about uh, remainders of the total Suzuki and all that. So, but you could just try to prove Lee Robinson using this strategy. <coughs> but now we'll not worry about that. We'll think of exact uh, circuits, not Hamiltonian evolutions. So this becomes exact. So yeah, as uh, Alessandro mentioned, I mean, uh, a buzzword, Lee Robinson bounds, right? For those of you who have not heard of this, I mean, uh, this is a general statement in uh, local, interact local interacting Hamiltonian dynamics on discrete lattices, uh, which says that there is an emergent causality. That means that correlations will not pr propagate faster than some upper bound. In this case, this upper bound is just speed one. It means one, one side per one unit time and not more. Now, uh, I have, I'm still not yet there. I mean, I'm now probably accelerating myself, but I have, I, now I can really show that there is nothing beyond that, right? I mean, again, for, 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 for the smart among you, it's already obvious, but still, it's not obvious, really. I mean, I have to write it down. But what I will now write down is something that will show that, indeed, correlations can only be non-zero. I mean, so what is the correlation? Yeah, first I have to define it. What is the correlation? Now, for me, the correlation function will be an object which will take two, two uh, local observables, let's call them A and B. I start with A and then measure B. So I, what I do is exactly this. I take this observable and then I measure, uh, then I measure the response in B, right? So this is like, if you want, this observable is like a local quench. It's like an excitation to a density matrix and then you make time evolution and you measure B. So that would be like a linear response, right? <clears throat> you make a small local quench and then you measure B. And then you measure it in a, in a fully mixed state because there is no other state around. Everything is highly non-equilibrium. Nothing is in general conserved. So there is no Gibbs state. The only Gibbs state which makes sense is beta equals zero, infinite temperature, which is the, what mathematicians call a threshold state. So it's completely a democratic average over the Hilbert space. So this is what I will define as. And then I will have, okay, first let me make some So and then I will measure observable B at position Y and observable X I will excite at position X and I will propagate to time T. So that's the most general thing you can think of, which is a most general local two-point function you can think of. And in the next, let's say, 30 minutes, I will describe to you how for a class of dynamics, which is not so, I mean, at least not so trivial, you can compute this in terms of a simple Markov chain. So that's the kind of the, 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 the next goal, is to write explicitly dynamics for what I will call dual unitary, dynam dual unitary circuits. I will write explicitly this many body correlation function of two local observables in terms of a single body quantum channel. So there is this connection, which I hope you will appreciate. It's really kind of nice. <clears throat> dual unitary, I mean, I'm just teasing you, so I will defi defi define what I mean by that. Yeah, it has a meaning that it is, uh, by dual I mean that you, you flip space and time. So, I mean, there was the first, this space-time duality, right? So I'm referring to this space-time duality. So uh, what I will mean by that is that the dynamics is unitary both when it's propagated in space or in time. Yeah. But let, let me just not accelerate uh, myself and just uh, go slow, slowly. So now this is, this object now is, just to spell it out, aha, and then, I have to write, of course, the proper normalization here. Sorry for that. In order to make these things defined, like that. Um, this is just trace of A. This is, again, what some people write, would write a Hilbert-Schmidt Hilbert product between two observers A and B. Now, if you have nice observables like monetization, which is like Pauli matrix, uh, which has squared unit matrix, right? It squares to unit matrix, so then this would be one. Like if A and B would be let's say sigma Z, then C sigma Z sigma Z X X zero will be one. So this will be your kind of normalization of the correlation function, right? That's why I put this. 
1 over d to the L. It's like, a, you know, the correctly normalized uh, infinite temperature state. <clears throat> okay, so now, what is it? Now, if I uh, compute this correlation function, meaning that if, now suppose that if y minus x is larger than, uh, uh, larger than t, uh, but of course it has to be still, still smaller than L, so which means system has to be large enough. If system is large enough, and if the distance between observables is larger than t, meaning that, now this is, uh, again, I have to write like this. Well, maybe I go here. This means that I can now write the second, right, an observable now here will be B, right? But now this Y could be here. <clears throat> so this is X and this is Y. If X minus Y is larger than T, meaning that this guy is in the empty space here. So now what do I mean, what is the correlation function? Meaning that I have to multiply this and then I contract. I mean, this is what I have to do, right? But now you see this decomposes into a product, into a product of some complicated beast here, well, which is not complicated at all because now we can use again unitarity in this direction and this becomes just trace A. And this thing is a trace B. So this is just trace A times trace, trace B. So from this picture it's obvious once observables are separated enough, then the correlation function is just the product of the traces, which means product of the averages, right, statistical averages. Now I, I will assume that my observables will be traceless, which is a very kind of clever assumption because, or the rest would be kind of stupid, uh, because anything that has a trace kind of uh, can be subtracted and has a contribution which is not a two particle, but a single particle contribution or just a scalar. So, the honest connected part of the two-point function is just coming from traceless observables. So let's assume that observables are traceless, then this is zero. So whenever the observables are separated enough, this is zero. So the only interesting uh, correlations happen when the observables are in the mutual light cone, yeah? <coughs> okay, now, how am I doing with time? Oh, great, so I think I will be, yeah, I just have to, come to do limitarity today, but I think I'll manage. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, right, so now I will uh, introduce a new concept, uh, which again has been around for several years now, uh, in various manifestations, in various uh, papers, which is called the folded picture. So this folded picture is, uh, has different names. In high energy physics, it's called thermofield dynamics and so on and so forth. It's just an idea that you can uh, treat Heisenberg dynamics as a Schrodinger dynamics in the, in the in large Hilbert space. So in, instead of thinking of this kind of Keldish contour going forward and backward in time, you could just think of going forward in time with a double propagator, with a propagator which encodes states which encodes operators, which, which uses states which encode operators. And actually, uh, I made a simple experiment uh, to show you how this works. I mean, I hope you see that paper, right? That's how the Heisenberg evolution of a local operator looks like, right? And now what I will do, I will actually fold it, right? So now I will do it like this. Now this is U, U transpose, uh, U dagger, uh, right? I'm sorry, U and U, U, U dagger above, right? and observable, so now when I will fold, then this lower guy, or I can fold like this, lower guy comes on top of the transpose guy. So now I have basically uh, evolution which is uh, acting on a state, but it, it has a well, tensor product, a state, and it has a tensor product of U transpose, because this guy, when it was folded, it has to be transposed, right? So it's U transpose, tensor U dagger, right? That generates this evolution, right? I mean, it's just, you know, the way how to memorize these things, but, if you, but you know, I can write now formulas. I guess it's useful to see kind of experiment, right? <clears throat> so I will define now the local operator space, which is a space of endomorphisms over single body qubit space, and that's the same, that's isomorphic to 
two copies, right? <laughs> Which means that I can write an operator, AIJ, IJ, and I can identify it with with uh, an object like this, right? Which is which is uh, uh, which uh, resides in the tensor product of two copies. Yeah. <coughs> and now I will just introduce alternative diagrammatics. So instead of this guy, which is my A, I will now uh, introduce this guy when I will fold, right? And this I will now just write like this, okay? And now the unit operator, this is a unit operator. When it falls, it's just like this. And uh, remember, now two wires have been now, I mean, in our papers, we usually use uh, different font in different uh, th thickness of the line. So when we have a folding, I mean, usually these wires get thicker, but in my writing, this cannot be shown. So just imagine that after the next five minutes, I will only use folded circuits. So all the wires will encode operators, not states. But it's, it's the same. So now here, again, this is the same as this, but with a circle. <clears throat> now, I have to be a bit careful because with normalization. I mean, to make normalization a convenient one, I will, uh, I will identify this with, uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so. The same as vectorization, yeah, of the ST matrix, if you want, yeah. It's, 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 as I say, this trick appears in many different forms in the literature. Uh, it's very useful, one way or another. So, for example, now what happens with the gate? Now we have a gate which gets folded back to itself. So it's two copies. The copy behind is U dagger. The copy in front is U transpose. Right, and now this is E I I prime, J J prime, K K prime, and L L prime. Okay, and now this is what I will denote as uh, W, and my W then will be U transpose cross U dagger. Okay. Okay. All right. So now, <coughs> now I can simplify my my correlation function. I mean, that's the idea. The purpose of that is to have a very convenient and simple uh, representation of the two-point function. Because before you had to have this forward-backward contour, so I just want to have forward contour. Uh, <clears throat> As for what I'm going, in, going to discuss next, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, just simplifies things. I mean, <clears throat> Now I will, I defined now a fundamental two qubit gate. So I remember my node, uh, my, my, my font, my, my selection of symbols is like W is the operator gate. U is the local gate. W is just the local gate in operator form. So now curly W, script W will be then again formed of. Now remember when I try to, uh, There's one thing I maybe have to convince you, or I just give you as an exercise because maybe it's too much to go into all the detail. But remember, when you do this uh, folding uh, on a circuit, then the order of the even and the odd layer interchanges. So now, when you write the, this guy which acts on a local operator, then it has to first start with the odd and then with the even. I mean, you could even think it like this. I mean, this is A. Now. This is two layers, okay? I'll just explain it here. It's two layers. So this was even, odd, even, odd, and this was odd dagger, even dagger, odd dagger, even dagger. So you see now, when you start applying it to an operator, you start with the odd. Start with the odd, then with the even, then with the odd, and so on. So the, the order changes, right? I mean, it's so something that is usually inconsequential, but you know, can easily make typos in papers if you're not careful. Okay, now again, the same thing. So, U even is now 
W even is uh, W tensor product with itself L over two times. <coughs> and now let's write unitarity again. Now unitarity is super cool, right? I mean, it's, it's very simple, right? What does it mean, unitarity? Just look at this. Unitarity means that you could either contract these two wires, and then it would be like U, U dagger, and then this has to be the same, and this has to be the same. So contracting these two guys means that this has to be the same as this. Or, of course, there are two forms of unitarity, U dagger U and U, U dagger equal one. So the other is that when you contract from above, Now these contraction rules simplify even more, right? And now when you, uh, now when you can just look at normal correlation function again. So now correlation function would be like this. Uh, this is time. Place an observable A at position X. So this bullet is position X and it's A. This is a bullet at position Y and it is B. And then uh, everything that is outside this cone contracts, right? Uh, from now we fold it so that basically we contract everything that's outside this cone. Okay, so I just leave it. And also now we can do the same from above, right? You can use either this unitarity. Using this unitarity means that we have here, remember we have these guys here. And we can implement unitarity up to the shadow, which means we can contract away everything here which means we arrive something like this. I mean, I, you know, I will not waste your, your time to write in detail how the circuit looks like. I will just write the boundary condition. Circuit is a vertex model with this boundary condition, except here there is a bullet, right? And this bullet means A, position X. <coughs> I will write it like this. This means bullet here, position Y. Now, but I do the same from above because I can use the top unitarity. Top unitarity means I have this shadow. I have this boundary condition, right? <clears throat> so what I have now is basically is a vertex model in the rectangle. So what is left to contract, and which is hard, which I cannot say in general how to do, is, is, is a, a classical stat mech problem on the rectangle of size. Now this is roughly, this is x minus y, this is roughly y minus x, roughly t minus y minus x, minus x, and this is t plus y minus x, or the other way around. So these sides are connected to, you know, first of all, time has to be larger than distance between my, y minus x, otherwise this goes to nothing. But if it's larger, then there is this cute rectangle, which becomes a square when y is equal to x. When y is equal to x, then you have a perfect square, which is the hardest case, right? When you have x, x here, then this becomes just t, t, right? So now computing correlation functions is like as hard as computing partition sums of classical, but even harder because there is no Monte Carlo than classical vertex models, right? Uh, classical vertex models with complex weights. and uh, it's known in con co computer science literature, it's known that these kind of problems are usually hard. I mean, sharp P hard even. <clears throat> okay, uh, how am I doing? Yeah, so, sh sh quarter of, uh, well, yeah, maybe I, I continue for another 10 minutes and then I take five minutes for questions. And then I will just, <coughs> fine. Um, any question? Yeah. Say again. Uh, which part? Yeah, so I mean, I, I convince you that the computation of two-point function is equivalent to computing a partition sum of a vertex model, right? But this vertex model, again, I mean, the way I formulate it now, you could, it's, it's like, you know, it's a vertex model on the D square dimensional vertices, right? D square, right? So it's, why we discard because we had to fold. But if you want to think in terms of the simple Hilbert space, then you can think of having two sheeted vertex, right? It's like two layers because we have folded and then it's connected here. So it's like two pieces of paper 
each co this contains forward contour, this contains backward, backward contour. This is A and this is B, and they are glued here, and they are glued here, and glued here, and glued here. This, these bullets mean just like gluing, because it means connecting upper sheet with the lower sheet. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, but you know, it doesn't really bring you anything. I mean, to know that this is like a two-layered surface. Uh, we have not, I mean, as you will see now, I will go to s some drastic simplification by uh, assuming something else, and then we'll be able to, to say a lot about this. <clears throat> Now, before going there, let me just, uh, yeah, uh, as a convention, convention, we will define these guys as uh, so this thing, ij as one over square root of d, i, j matrix element, and this guy is again, ij will be one over square root of d delta ij. So please remember, I mean, in order to make things consistent, I have to put square root of Hilbert space dimension on each of these boundary vertices. Otherwise, I have to put this normalization factor at the end. I just decided to put it locally so that I don't have to worry about it. But that's just a convention, and then after I take this convention, then, yeah. Uh, this is really the diagrammatics of our correlation function without any extra correction needed. <clears throat> okay, now uh, to close uh, for today, I have to introduce something different, right? I mean, something that goes beyond this. So far, it was just a kind of introduction into circuits and tensor networks. So what I will do now, I will introduce you to uh, dual unitary circuits and tell you what is cool about them. Yes. Does it extend to two-sided observers? Yes. I mean, it extends to any observers with finite support. Yeah. It's essentially the same. It's, it gets a little bit complicated. I mean, technically, it gets a bit messy, but it's the same thing. Yeah, thanks. Of course, it gets all different when you get non-local observers. When observers are like finite distance, I mean, large distance apart, has support, which is all over the place, then we have to rethink everything. But here we are really thinking of what local dynamics can give us, right? I mean, geometrically local. <laughs> okay, so now, uh, yes, dual unitary circuits. <clears throat> so now, remember our gate, where we started uh, was like this. And this was uh, T. Let's call this a direction space X. And now let's think of this as a gate which goes into this, this direction. So let's d let me define a gate which I will denote as U tilde, which maps IK to JL. So instead of going this way, which would map ij to kl, it goes like ik to jl. So this is the same as u ij kl. So it means we just flip these two indices. We just have, we organize these indices in the, in the square, and then we flip these two guys. Okay, so just geometric, geometric uh, reflection around the space-time diagonal, yeah? flipping space and time. And now imagine what would happen if you would ask now that this u tilde is also unitary, that it also defines unitary dynamics, right? The, all the pictures I draw, basically, all they make sense if I think of time going sideways. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, so what I will now want is uh, that u, also, u tilde is also unitary. So dual unitarity means u, u dagger is is identity and u tilde u tilde dagger is identity. <clears throat> so what is the diagram which would give us the second identity? Well, u and u dagger. But now you have to connect this guy with this guy. 
right? And now it's called this uh, I K and this K prime I prime because we did uh, uh, transpose and conjugation, right? And now uh, if this guy is, uh, if this identity holds, because now this is U tilde, taking this as a bra and this as a cat, uh, then this should be equal to K, K prime, I, I prime, meaning delta I, I prime, delta K, K prime. <laughs> okay, and the other way around also for the, um, <clears throat> so there is the other unitarity, which is U dagger U equal one, which will go in the other direction. J L L prime J prime. Now this looks all messy. I mean, it looks quite well. I mean, it's you can work with it. And actually, in the first paper, uh, we actually worked with that uh, diagrams, right? But then it turns out if you fold your circuits, it gets much more uh, compact. And I, indeed, I mean, if you write these identities, now again, think of, think of then again doing folding our, our paper, right? So now this guy has to go on top, right? It becomes U transpose U dagger, and that just means you have to attach bullets on the sides, right? So now this, this guy becomes W bullets on this side, equal two bullets like this. This guy, this, the lower diagram becomes huh? well, it's on this side. <coughs> now we will call this contraction identity three and contraction identity four. So we have four contraction identities, uh, one, two, three, four, two unitarities and two sideways unitarities. The question is how powerful they are. So what is the, 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 the the purpose of this game is, of course, to try to contract your circuit. You know, you write your circuit as a tensor network, and then you want to contract it as much as you can. So to something that is, if possible, uh, efficiently contractable on a classical computer. So on something that, uh, or even analytically, right? And now, going back to this general correlation function, of course, this is hard, but it becomes easy. I mean, that's maybe something I forgot to say, but it becomes easy when easy when uh, one of the sides is small, right? When, I mean, I think this is minus and this is plus. So when y minus x is equal to, to t, right? Because then it becomes simply the, then it becomes this 1d. One 1d one tensor network, right? <clears throat> this is when the generate case, when y minus x is equal to t. <coughs> and that's easy. That's polynomial, com polynomial complexity because it's just multiplying matrices. These are just matrices. You first contract this on the sides. It's a matrix which has a row, column, row, column, row, column. So it's just m iterating a matrix on a vec initial vector A and then finally contracting it with respect to B. Now, what can we do for dual unitary circuits? It so happens that for dual unitary circuits, we can show that this is the only diagram which survives. And uh, I think I will just close, close here for today. I mean, if you don't see that, then I will show you tomorrow, tomorrow morning. But it's, uh, I just try to first, uh, I mean, I just say it in words, and tomorrow I will just uh, blow, uh, draw a few pictures from which it will become obvious. But you, you, you can see, right? And if you have this diagram, then if you use the sideways unitarity, the sideways unitarity allows us to, to annul this diagram, to show that if, if this A and B are sp displaced for less than Y minus, uh, so for, for, for less than T, right? Then if Y minus X is less than T, then this diagram can be uh, reduced to a product of traces of A and B, which is zero. And so the only, the only case in which it cannot be reduced to a product is when t is equal to y minus x, which is where we get this diagram. Okay, uh, now I think I should close for today and maybe take some questions. If
Okay, thank you. Let's thank uh, Tomáš for the uh, Some further questions? Uh, well, uh, yeah, you see, I mean, the, well, the historically, it came from uh, first uh, thinking of this space-time duality, uh, which uh, was a concept which was first uh, discovered for kick teasing model. I mean, it was found that kick teasing model, which is a special case of dual unity circuits, uh, I will mention it more in detail tomorrow, because it's the simplest model for which we can prove something about spectral correlations. And kick teasing model is uh, a model which is kind of self-dual, which means that it looks the same, essentially. Uh, it's the same model if you read it space-wise or time-wise. And then we stared at this, and when we saw, well, hey, but this is just a special case of a much more general class of gates, uh, we just ask this identity, right? Then, of course, there is other things. I mean, there are some exercises I want to give, but maybe, well, no, I, probably I should give tomorrow, but then I, there's no time. Well, there is one thing which is kind of, um, uh, important and this, of course, this. Yeah, but I have to, I have to, I have to arrive to some other concepts now. I cannot say that. I mean, this, this uh, uh, dual unitary circuits, of course, correspond to some objects in class in, in quantum information theory, which is also kind of mysterious, like un unistochastic quantum channels. So there is, there is some question of how, how to classify those guys, and what we can show is that this is mathematically identical. So this type of uh, unitary, dual unitary gates correspond to a particular class of quantum channels in quantum info. So this seems like a very special condition. So how does it, um, like is it robust to some deformations or? That's a very good question. I think it's uh, the main question that one has to answer. Uh, <clears throat> I think, I, my, I believe the answer is yes, that, it's, that it should be robust. So it's, uh, and there is some partial evidence for that. Um, and I, will, I hope I have enough time tomorrow to tell you more about this. Uh, but then, of course, he's right. Uh, as uh, integrability, also dual unitarity is a fine-tuned feature, so it is not structurally robust. I mean, as soon as you break it, it's gone. Um, but I believe that it has much more chances to be kind of perturbatively stable, because as you will see tomorrow, we can now uh, disclose the full ergodic hierarchy here. So we can basically find examples of arbitrary fast degree of relaxation to equilibrium. Unlike in integrable systems, or in systems close to integrable, where they have this annoying pre-terminalization phenomenon, here you can engineer models which go in one shot or in few iterations to equilibrium. So correlations can decay super fast, like exponentially. And, and I think that's a very good case for structural stability. So that means that, that to my intuition, also should provide some results on stability. But we are not yet there. So it's some work in progress. I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, hi, uh, just a technical clarification. On the second chalkboard for contraction identity four, the bullet should be on the other side of the 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 two legs, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, <laughs> thank you. That's uh... Also, like when working with this type of model, is sort of the strategy to like construct a U that exhibits this property? Sorry? Um, is the strategy to sort of like construct a U that exhibits this property yeah. and then to yeah. um, sort of explore what happens? Yeah, uh, it is, yeah. I mean, uh, I will tell you tomorrow, there is a, we have a full parameterization of this dual unitaries for Q bits uh, to find uh, full characterization for Q bits for D larger than two is an open problem, which is related to this problem on classifying quantum channels. But uh, we have families, we have large families of examples for higher Hilbert space dimensions. We can even think of classical limits of dual unitaries which also are interesting uh, as classical dynamic, chaotic dynamics. Um, I will say more about this tomorrow. But, yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? No, they're not always chaotic. Uh, they are generically chaotic, uh, but they can be everything. They can be even integrable. They can be interact, non-interacting, interacting, interacting, integrable, and 
there's a whole zoo. I, mean, I will discuss this zoo tomorrow, but there is a whole, there is this, uh, what is usually referred to as ergodic hierarchy in dynamical systems theory. And here you can basically uh, class, I mean, you can find examples of all these classes that mathematicians like as representative examples of dynamics. Um, is it uh, generalizable to two plus one dimension? And is it useful to do so? In, uh, you say in, in plus one, in, uh, like in two dimensions. Two special dimensions yeah. and yeah. one temporal. It is. It is. It is uh, there are papers already out uh, for uh, proposing uh, two plus one dimensional dual geometry. They call it Turner, ternary, how is it called, uh, the correct English? Uh, ternary, ternary unitary or something like that. Because you have unitarity in three different ways, right? Uh, and then people showed, I mean, there is a paper by Christian Mendel and collaborators from TU Munich uh, where they discuss this. I don't know if it was, it was published in PRL or not, but it was written in like a letter style. I, I, I read it on the archive. I, I, uh, you can find it under this name. But it's, it's basically very analogous construction. <coughs> um, yeah. The answer is yes. This is a follow-up question. So you said that it's not always chaotic, right? So the point is, the Anatolis lecture, we saw that if there any fine-tuning parameter is there by which we can do integrable to ergodic transition in this kind of models. Yeah. And in between the most chaotic region, like he said, that integrable to ergodic region transition will happen through some chaotic region. It's not the direct transitions happening. So is there that kind of feature one can see this? Uh, you will see tomorrow. I mean, there is a very simple chaos to regularity to, or to ergodicity to non-ergodicity transition in this model. Okay. You just play with some parameters of the gate, and you will see that uh, you get uh, a transfer matrix whose uh, gap suddenly becomes uh, closed, and then it becomes non-ergodic. So, uh, but this transfer matrix is a finite dimensional, so okay. everything is fully analytical and without any issues. Again, you say it's a bit boring because it's fine-tuned, yeah. But it's, it's at least one example we have where we can control the chaos to non-ergodicity transition. Seems like no further public questions, so you can continue discussing with Tomas. And well, yeah, okay, let's meet at 11.05 uh, for the next lecture. <laughs>